Well, good morning. It's great to see all your smiling faces under those masks. I guess smiling eyes is what I see right now. I see smile eyes. That's great. Uh, So as Pastor Brent already said, we're in the middle of this series, uh, Beyond. And today, like he said, we're talking about going beyond hospitality. And this is the first message that we could take this title and equally teach it at the Sheraton as we could at the church. When we think of hospitality, it's not necessarily a church word in the same way as beyond religion or beyond evangelism are like church words. Uh, Because when we think of hospitality, often we might think of the hospitality industry. Like it's no longer a house to house thing in some people's minds, it's what's done Uh, by the businesses that provide services. So Perkins providing home-cooked meals is hospitality or having a comfy bed to sleep in when you're traveling through a town. Uh, Even Motel 6 says they're going to leave the lights on for you. How much more hospitable can you get than that? People are taking care of you. And there are some, though, that when they think of hospitality, they're like, okay, They have the Martha Stewart Living magazine where your home is completely immaculate. You have these beautiful decorations when you have people over. You have amazing food. And it's all about having everything perfect and picture perfect. Even your kids, like they have to be perfect. Let's get your hair right. Okay, now people can come over. Um, So before we continue, we have to, I want to pre-poll the audience and figure out where you all are at with hospitality. So I've got a couple scenarios with two options, A and B. It's going to be like being at the eye doctor, A or B, A or B. And you're going to say which one fits you more. And you may say, well, Ryan, I fall somewhere in the middle. You can't say that. You have to choose, okay? So first one is when you're having dinner with friends, you want to have dinner with friends, are you more likely to A, split the check when you go to a restaurant, Or B, invite them into your home and prepare the meal. A, go to a restaurant, split the check. Okay, and this is before COVID when nobody went to restaurants or had anybody in their home. Okay, come on, let's, we're going to forget this year happened and it'll be wonderful for a moment. Okay, split the check at a restaurant, a few hands. B, invite people into your home. Oh, a lot more hands there. All right, some of you like having people over. Good. Family is passing through town, not your parents, like second cousin, third removed, okay? I will pay for your room at La Quinta, and why don't you come over for breakfast? Or I will sleep on an air mattress in the living room so you can stay in my master bedroom. A, pay for the hotel, a few hands. B, you're on an air mattress. Wow, you guys, would you really do it? Now, let me tell you, it's uncomfortable when it's offered to you. Michelle and I had been married six months. We went and we visited her parents' old college friends. So people I'd never met in my entire life, they were like 55 years old, significantly older than us. And they're like, we will sleep in the living room on an air mattress. You have our entire master bedroom. I'm like, no, that's so weird. They're like, no. We refuse to do anything else. So like I'm in this beautiful home, beautiful bedroom, and they were on an air mattress. That, I was like, wow, there is something different about them. They were amazing Christians. (laughs) Hosting a party. Are you more concerned about the guests being comfortable? Or are you more concerned about how you have impressed the guests with the food and the decor? Are you worried about, is everybody comfortable? Or are you worried about, are they pleased with how I did? A, comfort. B, how people think about you. Yeah, that's a big thing in our culture, isn't it? You want to make sure that they're like, you know how to throw a party. It's not about you. Shame on you. No, we'll get into that. All right, moving on. A friend stops over unannounced. A, you're annoyed they didn't schedule first. Or B, you're excited to connect with your friend over coffee. A, okay, people, some people are definitely annoyed. And they're okay saying that. B, you're like, okay, I'm glad. And Amy says it depends on how clean the house is. Okay, good for... It does, though. I get it. Okay, you see a new face at church or a new mask. Who knows? Do you go introduce yourself and invite them to lunch? Or do you hope that they don't make eye contact so you have to have the awkward hi? A, you're taking them to lunch. Ooh, B, uh, new face, I don't know. Yeah, and I get, 
Some of this is honestly based on introverts and extroverts. For some of you introverts, you're like, yeah, there is no way that I'm walking up to a stranger and then saying, let's have a meal together. I want to slowly step into this. So some of this is wiring, but what I wanted you to see is that while some of us have greater comfortability with hospitality, it does have to do with wiring, and none of what I talked about is really like this is what's prescribed when we talk about biblical hospitality. In fact, when you start talking about what hospitality in the Bible is, you'll see that it's actually incredibly vague. The word shows up four times in the New Testament, and these are three of them. Romans 12, 9, it's in a list of what Christians should do and says, practice hospitality. Okay, uh, Titus 1.8 is a list of what sh- the characteristics of an overseer should be, and it says they should, must be hospitable, nothing else. 1 Peter 4.9, he writes, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. So we get a little bit of framework of what it's supposed to look like, but when you look at these verses, you realize the Bible's just saying, you know, it's taking the Nike slogan mentality of just do it, but it's not actually telling us how to do it. It's just saying, be hospitable. And as Christians, there really is very little debate. Should we be a hospitable people or not? We understand that's an important part of being a Christian. But the question becomes, what does it look like for us today? Uh, preparing for this message, I was looking online for different ways that pastors have preached this or how different people think about it. And the spectrum is wide. One pastor talked about how there's a car that parks on his street frequently that's a homeless couple. And when it gets super cold in Minnesota, he'll go out with a $100 bill and pay for them to go get a hotel room for the night. Another pastor had a phenomenal message about the biblical basis of hospitality. And then in the application part, he said, and this is why we as a church work with other denominations and want to help other churches be successful. And I was like, oh, I didn't see it going there. Like, it stayed totally at this high-level corporate level. Uh, I read blogs about a woman who was writing a woman's blog, and it was like, take people out to lunch after church. Every single week, try to take people out to lunch. I'm like, well, that's a high bar. I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, I have missionary friends in the Middle East, and they said in the Middle East, culture is so different than in America. And she's like, once people stop over, you just are the host until they leave. She's like, sometimes I'll have a whole day of stuff I have to get done and somebody will stop over for coffee at 11 in the morning. And at 10.30 at night, after I've put my children to bed, made them lunch, made them dinner, and not done a thing for the last 12 hours, then they'll say, well, I guess it's time for me to go, and they'll go home. But that's what hospitality looks like in the Middle East. So, like I said, the spectrum is very wide. I'm not trying to guilt you to say you should be taking people to dinner every Sunday or buying hotel rooms for every person you see on the street who's homeless. But somewhere along the line, we have to figure out, okay, what does it mean for us to practice hospitality? And what I'm not going to do today is tell you, here are three things to do. It's really more about developing an attitude toward about being hospitable so that in all situations, you see it through the lens that God wants us to see this in. And so to do that, I think that what we can do is look at the patterns that we find in some narrative stories in the Bible where we see similarities from one story to the next and kind of draw some conclusions from that. So I want to go back first to Genesis chapter 18. And here we've got a story with Abraham. He is the patriarch. He is the start of the Jewish faith and therefore the Christian faith. And This is what we read in Genesis 18, beginning in verse 2. It says, Abraham, he was out, he looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass by your, or do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. And so he shows up, he runs to them, he offers to wash their feet, offers them food, offers them water. He's preparing everything that they might need as weary travelers. And what I didn't share with you is in verse 1, we get what we find out about these three travelers that Abraham didn't know is that it was actually two angels and the Lord who were visiting him. In the very next chapter, we have a story about Abraham's nephew Lot. 
Uh, Many similarities, chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. Two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. He didn't know they were angels. And Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground, clearly the custom. My lords, he said, please turn aside your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we'll spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. And he prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. So we see a lot of similarities here. The provision of food. We see the provision of lodging in Lot's story. We see that they're both taking care of their basic needs as travelers and washing their feet. The story with Lot actually goes really sideways as you keep reading this. It gets messed up. The men in the town want to do harm to the angels, and Lot provides protection for these visitors that he has in his home. Essentially what we see is in the Old Testament, hospitality looked like when people came and you brought them into your home, you treated them like your own family. You were the father, it was your house, the father's house, and once you brought a stranger in, even if you didn't know them, you treated them like your own family and providing for all their needs and even providing protection. And I could go on with other stories in the Old Testament or in the Torah, there are numerous laws about how you had to treat strangers and travelers coming through. In the New Testament, you have to understand, Jesus didn't have a home to go back to. So Jesus was completely reliant on the hospitality of others to invite him into their home and take care of him. The same with Paul, one of the greatest missionaries who spread Christianity all over the Mediterranean region. In fact, hospitality was so attributed to Christians in the early church years uh, after Jesus that I actually found a passage about a Roman satirist, so he's not pro-Christian at all. In fact, he's writing about how gullible Christians are and that they can be taken advantage of. And this happened where a charlatan named Peregrinus, he, uh, he made Christians believe he was a Christian and he ended up in jail. And this is what uh, Lucian wrote about this situation. He said, from as far away as Asia Minor, Christian communities sent committees paying their expenses out of the common funds to help him with advice and consolation. The efficiency the Christians show whenever matters of community interest like this happen is unbelievable. They literally spare nothing. This is what a guy is writing about an early Christian community at 165 AD. It's unbelievable. They literally spare nothing. Christians were known as a people that said, if you have need, we are here to help. And so when we look at all these patterns of what hospitality looks like, we start to see a couple of things that we can draw out for ourselves today. Who are we supposed to be hospitable to in the first place? And what we see is it's friends and strangers. Uh, Hospitality literally means uh, love of strangers. So we know that that's a part of it, but it's also taking care of your friends and family. In the New Testament, there's several verses about being hospitable to one another. That means to those who are within the Christian community. Uh, In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, These stories about Abraham and Lot were so famous, they're getting mentioned here in Hebrews 13 in the New Testament, where it's written, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. That's the love of friend, taking care of people you know. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And so it's pointing back to their very early roots of the Jewish faith. They were hospitable people and they even entertained angels. And so in Hebrews they're saying, who knows? Granted, we shouldn't be hospitable to strangers like, oh, hopefully I get an angel to show up. But we should be understanding, this is just our heritage. This is who we are as followers of Jesus. We are people who are hospitable to friends and to strangers. Jesus talks about this a little bit when he's at a banquet with a bunch of Pharisees. And, of course, the Pharisees invited all the other religious important people, and Jesus got an invite because he had become so well-known. But this is what he teaches them in Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. He says, When you give a luncheon or dinner, 
do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Ultimately, they can't repay you, but the repayment comes from your heavenly Father. So Jesus is again pointing to this fact. It's not just about your friends that you show hospitality to. Anybody can do that. It's also about strangers who may never be able to pay you back. It's not just about those that you trust or are comfortable with or willing to share your things with. It's sometimes putting yourself at risk and saying, I don't know how this is going to go, but I know that I have a God who wants me to open my arms to people all around and meet their needs. The next is, it's for Christians and everybody else. Some people try to parse out hospitality and say it's specifically only for the Christian community. And so we show love for each other, but if somebody's known to not be a Christian, well then you don't, the, the order, the imperative to practice hospitality doesn't apply to those people outside of the church. But let's just understand that's kind of a silly thing to say. If you're supposed to be hospitable to strangers, you don't ask them before they come in, so where are you at with Jesus, friend or foe? Would you like to tell me about your spiritual condition? Like, it just, if they're a stranger and they have a need, lodging, food, care, whatever it is, you open your doors and you say, I want to help you. And we translate that, obviously, across cultures right now, but I want to help meet your needs is what it means to follow Jesus for Christians and for everyone else. Because we have to understand, our hospitality is not based on their spiritual condition, but it's based on our own. We don't do this because of who they are. We do this because of who we are and who lives inside of each one of us. Third thing, pattern in hospitality we see is that it's both activity and affection. Showing welcome to others is more than just what we do for them. It's also the attitude that we have towards them. Because let's be honest, if you walk out of here and you're like, well, Ryan said I have to be hospitable. So next week you come to church and you find a stranger and you're like, you, me, lunch, want to go? And then you have lunch and you're like, okay, yeah, okay, I'm eating my food. I did it, cross it off the list. They're probably going to know your heart wasn't into it, right? But what the connection of hospitality with strangers is it's saying, you and I don't know each other, but I want to get to know you. By taking the action towards you, I want to also grow my heart and my love towards you. I want to turn you from stranger to friend. And so that's why it's, got this affection is important. Hospitality should leave the other person feeling appreciated rather than as an annoyance. Sometimes as Christians, we've done that. We're like, well, we've got the food pantry at the church. We're going to do this. And, you know, you set it up. You think it's a great idea to show hospitality, to care for people's needs, but then it becomes a burden. And everybody that you're serving figures out that it's a burden to you, and they know it. They don't really want to be served by you then. You need to, they need to feel appreciated, not as an annoyance. And when you put your affection towards them, you will learn to love them. The love of God will well up inside of you, and it will move from annoyance to, you know what, after they leave, I feel good that I was able to be a blessing to somebody else. And finally, we need to understand when we talk about hospitality, we both play the role of host and of guests. In this message, probably most of us have been thinking about how we can be a good host towards somebody else. But let's be honest, we're all at some point playing the role of guest. When I went out to Seattle and I was sleeping in basically a stranger's master bedroom, I was the guest at that point, and I was receiving hospitality. And I wanted to say no. And you all probably are like me, We have a terrible time receiving hospitality as Americans. When people, you know, if something comes up in your house, let's say, for instance, you get bed bugs, okay? And you need to have an exterminator come in and, like, fumigate your whole house, and they're like, you can't sleep in your house for two days. A or B, are you calling a friend to say, hey, I've got bed bugs, can I come sleep in your house? (laughs) 
Or B, are you logging in to an app and booking a hotel for you and your family? B, are all of you B? Right, because, well, I don't want to be a burden on somebody. And when we say that, we're saying, I don't want to give them the opportunity to practice hospitality towards me. I'll use the hospitality industry instead, right? So we need to, we need to be willing to receive it. When somebody's offering to pick up the check, don't fight them tooth and nail forever and be like, no, no, you can't do it. If they're offering, they're trying to be hospitable, they're trying to care for you, receive it gladly, feel blessed. It's okay. Jesus received hospitality often, and he also provided it. So moving on, as I was researching for this message, I came across an article by Ed Stetzer about the difference between entertaining others and being hospitable. And when I read it, I really kind of saw it as, okay, these are four tips for how you can be a good host when practicing hospitality towards others. The first is you want to bless and not impress. This isn't about you, it's about them. The whole concept of what you're doing and providing care for others isn't so that they can look at you and be like, wow, you're an amazing host. It's so that when they walk out of your home, they say, you know, I just had a good time. That was fun. I felt loved on and cared for. I like that person. It's not about you, it's about them. Secondly, you should savor and not stress. If you're stressing about every little thing being perfect, you're doing it wrong. Hospitality is not supposed to be a chore and a pain. It should be something that you enjoy as much as them as you connect at a heart level with somebody else. You should listen and not babble. If you find yourself doing all the talking, you're doing it wrong, okay? Stop, ask a question. It should not be all about you doing the entertaining and the talking and being the center of attention. It's you drawing them in, learn about them, care for them, listen. And fourthly, it should be including and not excluding. Uh, So instead of just us four no more, I'll invite only my friends. It should be trying to bring others in, maybe others who never get an invite, maybe immigrants in Des Moines. They typically don't get invites from white Americans. And so to say, hey, you know, outside who I might normally think to invite, would you like to come over and join us for dinner? So that they can feel honored and included as opposed to as still an outsider in somebody else's land. And as I looked at this list, I realized that even though uh, he never had his own Martha Stewart decorated home, Jesus actually was a terrific host. Jesus blessed others. At the wedding in Cana, he, they ran out of wine. Big problem for the host. And Jesus quietly turns the water into wine. He saves the host a lot of grief and embarrassment. He doesn't want anybody to know about it, but he's a huge blessing in that situation to everybody there. And they didn't even know what he'd done for them. He savored and not stressed. When he sits with Mary and Martha, he goes to their home and he sees Martha is completely stressing out about being the host and doing everything right. He's like, Martha, slow it down for a moment here. Just sit and savor and look at what Mary's doing. Be like that. Be able to just enjoy this time together and learning. You don't have to stress about everything being so big and so perfect. He was all about listening and not babbling. Yes, we see that Jesus spoke often, but he also asked over 300 questions in our Bible. He was often about getting others to be thinking and speaking back with that question asking. It's a great skill that he had. We need to follow that and learn that it's important to include others in the conversation. It's not about monologue. I've been doing a monologue now for 25 minutes. Some of you are bored. You should never do a monologue for 25 minutes in your own home. It should be a back and forth conversation. I recently had a phone call with somebody. I was driving. I had terrible reception for like a 10-minute stint. The person I was talking to had no idea because they hadn't stopped talking for 10 minutes. So I heard it breaking in and out, and they had no idea because I hadn't spoken, so they didn't know I was cutting in and out. And finally, Jesus included in a world where men were everything, essentially. He invited women, Mary and Martha, to be there with him. He invited the little children to come to him. He was going out and speaking with the lepers and the lame and the blind. He was meeting people he had no business to be meeting. He was an includer. And so we take our cues from Jesus, the example, of what it means to be a host 
who practices hospitality. The most famous moment where Jesus does this is at the Last Supper, where he and his disciples have gathered in the upper room. They're remembering the Passover meal. And he sits and he washes their feet, just like Abraham washed the angel's feet and Lot washed the angel's feet. Jesus does that for his disciples. He offers them the food. He offers them the drink. He offers them himself and his time. Jesus was a man who showed how hospitality is to be done day by day, what that attitude looks like in our own lives. And so what's at the heart of hospitality really here is making room for others. When you think hospitality, think making room for others. Literally making room in your home sometimes if they need it, providing lodging. Making room at the dinner table to share a meal with somebody. Making room for somebody in your calendar. One great thing about COVID, it slowed down our calendars a lot, and we've learned, you know what? The slower pace is better. Let's stay that way, please. And make time in our calendars to have people be able to drop over. Or when a neighbor walks by, be able to stop and have a 20-minute conversation with them and not be like, hey, yeah, good to see you. i got to keep going and running all my errands. But it's taking time for people. And finally, we have to make room for them in our heart. Moving them from the category of stranger or acquaintance to friend. I want to know you. I want to show you that I actually genuinely care about you. That's what hospitality is. It's just the outworking of the love of God flowing through us in a very tangible way. And the reason God's so concerned that we make room for others in our lives and that we go beyond hospitality is because he has gone so far to care for us, to connect with us, and to make room for us. After he'd had that meal with his disciples in the upper room, we see the next chapter, John chapter 14. Jesus says, my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. In the same way, we welcome others into our lives, into our home to share a meal. We look forward to this moment where God, Father God, says, come to my house. Share a banquet meal with me. Come stay with me. Let me protect you. Let me show you that Father's house, love, care, concern, and protection for all of you. And until that day that that happens in the new heaven and the new earth for all of eternity, I want all of you now as representatives of me to show that kind of care to everybody that you run across. To invite people into your house to meet their needs with your resources. Because hospitality, it is costly, let's be honest. You can't share a meal and do all these things without sometimes putting yourself in a bit more discomfort, sometimes emptying your wallet a little bit more, sometimes having to rearrange your schedule. There's a cost to practicing hospitality. But we have to understand it's worth it. God didn't do this for us and tell all of us to do it. Be hospi- or Practice hospitality. All the overseers have to be hospitable. He's not saying that just as a chore to put on a list. He's saying it's better this way. You will feel blessed as you are able to bless others. That's what God told Abraham from the very beginning. And that's how we are to be living our lives as well. And so as we wait now on this earth, we understand we have this opportunity to show the hospitable love of the Father to everybody around us. And so we need to take some of these patterns, some of these things I've talked about, we need to think, how can I incorporate that into my day-to-day life? It doesn't mean inviting every single homeless person you pass into your home, providing them a bed and a meal. It might. Who knows? Listen to what the Spirit of God says and tells you. But it does mean you can't just drive by every situation when you hear of somebody having a need, just being like, oh, sorry about that. I'll pray for you and keep going. We have to be willing to step in and help. Because today what I really want you to see, the big idea here, is hospitality is a lot more than sharing a meal. It's sharing a life. It's putting the interests 
of others ahead of yourself. And we all know that is truly the heart of the gospel.